Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. We hope you're encouraged by the message. For more in-depth content and answers to questions submitted during the sermon, check out our podcast called Postscript. You can find it on iTunes or on our website at faithbridge.org forward slash podcast. Well, howdy. Good to see you. Uh, Yeah, so we at Breakaway Ministries, uh, where I work full time, have launched an app uh, for your iPhone, iPad, Android device, even Windows phone, you know, which exists, uh, I guess. No one in here has one. I was waiting for someone to be like, Windows Phone. No. Okay, great. Um, well, for that one guy, we're there for you. But um, on the app, it has uh, all of the sermons that we give at Breakaway. Uh, but it also has, what the video was talking about, is, is a series of short videos that, that aren't focused in on me or my face. It's, it's looking at the text and teaching you how, how to study the Bible. It's, it, we did it for for all the people of all ages that I've encountered throughout my years of ministry that say, hey, I've, I've tried to start reading the Bible on my own and I feel totally lost. I don't, I don't know how to do it. Uh, it's, it's to help you do it. It's to, to be something you can go to on a daily or weekly basis and uh, get the tools you need to study well while studying a book together. So we're excited about that. The app also has the whole audio Bible on it. You can listen to the whole Bible if you want to. Uh, and it's all free. So uh, it's just out there for you. Uh, so you can go to iTunes or whatever and uh, download it. And hopefully it'll be an encouragement to you. So that's what that is. And um, with that said, let me read to you from Philippians chapter 1. That's where we are this morning. Philippians 1, verse 9 through 11. We'll read the Bible together now and uh, see what the Lord has for us. So, <clears throat> Philippians 1, uh, beginning in verse 9, <clears throat> says this. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent. And so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Let me pray for us. Uh, Well, Lord, I wanna thank you for this moment here to, to think about these things. What we just read, whether we grabbed it or not, is a pretty profound statement. It's a pretty powerful prayer to pray for our own lives, for other people's lives. It's a life-changing kind of thing to ask you for. And God, I, I feel the, the distance sometimes from, from biblical language to our real life. And I just pray, God, by your grace, we could, we could cross that distance. We could bring it together. That if reading these words didn't land on us in a way that was moving or powerful, I pray as we linger in them together, you would open our eyes to see what it would look like to live this way as a mom or a dad or a student or a friend, that we can engage this idea of how you've called us to live in the midst of our very real lives. And I just think if we could see that union of your powerful word and our personal life There's something beautiful there I I want for all of us. And we're just asking you to do it, God. Please meet with us now and and teach us. And I want to invite you, if you're willing, to take a minute and ask him yourself. Say, Lord, please teach me something right now. And then if you would, please pray for me that the Lord would use me and I would be helpful to you. Well, Father, we love you, and we trust you. Use this time, and we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, everybody prays, at least the vast majority of people on the planet. In survey after survey, they see that the vast majority of people on the globe today say that at some point, at some level, they acknowledge uh, a creator, someone higher, and give thanks. In America, The vast majority of Americans say they pray. The vast majority of Americans say in survey after survey that they pray daily. Daily, they're having some kind of exchange 
with God. And my question this morning is, when you pray, uh, what do you say? Do you ask him to bless your food? You know, do you say, Lord, thank you. Let this be nourishing to our body, even though you never use the word nourish in any other conversation throughout the day, and you're not even quite clear what you're asking him to do to the food in that moment. Uh, is that kind of how it goes? Or do you do what I think most of us do? Honestly, I think most of us, uh, we pray for our circumstances. Uh, we say, God, I've got, I'm in a situation or, or I'm seeing a situation that I want to be different. God, this person's sick, and I don't want him to be sick anymore. Will you fix that? God, I have this stress at work. Will you, will you take it away? God, there's a problem here that I want to not be a problem anymore. Lord, there's, there's a person that I want them to notice me or give me their attention. There's a, there's a person that I want to stop noticing me and stop giving me attention. Like We talk about circumstances that we want him to fix or we want him to change. And, and I don't think any of that's bad, by the way. But what's interesting is we're looking at this prayer that Paul prayed for his people, this short little section of three verses. And, and I want to look at it because it's such a powerful thing to say, to ask God to do in our own lives, in the lives of the people we care about, because it's the kind of prayer that could make you and make me flourish in any circumstance. What he's asking for for his people and what I'm praying for us and what I'm hoping we'll get around to pray for ourselves and for those we care about is the kind of prayer that would make us flourish whether it's a good season or a bad one, regardless of age, gender, stage in life, that this is the kind of prayer that could be transformative to us as people because it touches down on every part of us. It touches down on our heart and how we feel and on our mind and how we think and, and our lives, how we live. It's such a powerful prayer that I was tempted to call this sermon the greatest prayer. But then I was like, well, the truth is there's the one called the Lord's Prayer, and it's kind of hard to say a prayer that the Lord prayed gets second place. It just feels like he should be in the top spot. But I didn't want to name this like the second greatest prayer in the world. That felt kind of like a weird title. But the truth is, I think this is the greatest prayer Paul could think to pray for his people. And it's the greatest prayer I could think to pray for you and I want us to get our head around it, what to ask God for. And it's got about five little movements to it. And you see the first piece in verse 9, it says, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more. And I just think that's so incredible. Paul launches into this letter, and the first thing he prays for is their love. Isn't that amazing? He doesn't pray for their circumstances at all. He prays for their affections. He prays for their hearts, what they care about. Isn't that crazy? Like, have you ever done that for somebody? Have you ever just stopped and go, Lord, I just pray for, for their capacity to feel and, and how they interact with you and others and their love. Like, he prays for their love. I think that's such a profound way to start a prayer because it, it declares something to us today. And what it says is God cares about what you care about. God cares about how you feel. And I don't know about you, but when that dawned on me in life, that was so profound. Because I grew up in a, a, a tradition, oftentimes in, in ministry and life and religion, I, I felt like the message coming to me was, God doesn't really care about how you feel. And maybe some of you grew up where your understanding of God as you were coming up was, God just cares about what you do. Just do the right thing and I don't really care how you feel about it. I mean, for me coming up, there was an illustration that was really popular, and it was the illustration of a train. Uh, and they would have this picture of a train, and they would have the engine of the train, and they would say, the engine of the train is facts. And by that, they meant the facts of the Bible, the truths about who God is and what he's done. And then the next car in the picture was a car attached to the engine, and it was called faith. And what they were saying is what matters is that there's the right facts about God and you connect to those facts with your faith. And then there was a third train called feelings and it was the caboose. And what they said was the feelings doesn't really matter. They're like, can the train run without the caboose? Yes. And so the caboose is unnecessary. It doesn't really matter. And the point they were trying to make, which was a good point, was... When your emotions go up and down, that doesn't change the truths of who God is and what he's done. And that's a good point. That no matter what's happening emotionally on a given day, you have a great day and you're like, God is awesome. She breaks up with you and you're like, it's all darkness. Like no matter what happens emotionally, God is still God, he is still true and he's still worthy of your trust. And that's a good point, that's true. But what I misunderstood 
in that illustration was that you got to believe the right thing so you can do the right thing and how you feel about it, God doesn't really care. That's how I thought it worked. And there was a song when I was coming up too, like in high school and stuff. It was a popular Christian song called Love is a Verb. I don't know if anyone remembers that one. And what they're saying is love is a verb, love is a verb, which it is. But the point they were trying to make is love isn't about how you feel. Love's about what you do. That was the point of the song. I don't care if you feel good thoughts about me. What, what matters is what you do, and that's what love is. So love is taking out the trash. Love is coming to pick me up when I'm stranded, right? <laughs> love is give me a call on the phone. They're saying love is that. But as you think about it, I think, no, it's not. Taking out the trash is taking out the trash. Picking me up when I'm stranded is picking me up when I'm stranded. Calling me is calling me. That's not love. Those can be ways to express love or they cannot. But those actions aren't love. But love can be a motivator to those actions and make those actions beautiful as they're an expression of what's in my heart. But the point is, those aren't love. Love can motivate those things and motive matters. Motive matters to God. And it matters to us. Like, ladies, imagine if your husband or boyfriend or significant other says to you, uh, hey, I want to take you to a restaurant, and they take you to your favorite restaurant. I mean, the one that you're like, I can't believe we're going there. This is so amazing. They have that dessert you love. Let's say he takes you there, okay? And as you're sitting there, you're like, oh, my gosh, this is going to be great. And the whole time, you look across the table at him, and he could not look less interested. He's kind of looking around, checking his phone. And so you would naturally ask him the obvious question. So what's the occasion? Why are we here? And what if he said, I don't know, because I just thought I was supposed to. I mean, you like this place, so I figured, oh, let's just give her what she wants, try to make her happy, and then I'm going to move on and do something I feel like doing. <laughs> How do you respond? Do you go, aw, Huh? No! He ruined it! Even when the dessert comes and it's your favorite dessert, it's sitting there in front of you and you're like, I can't even eat this because it's tainted with your hate, right? I mean, <laughs> he ruined the thing with the motive. The motive matters and it matters to God. God is not looking for you to do the thing because you're supposed to. That's not what he cares about. God cares about how you feel. God cares about your love, and love is a motive. And so he talks here, and what he cares about is your love. Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. That's a command in the book of Philippians. Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said to love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And then it explodes into love for people. God cares about your heart. In the 1700s in America, there was a massive spiritual awakening that happened in our country, changed our country. We're still feeling the effects of it in some way. And this great awakening to spiritual life brought all these people into great interest in the Bible, praying as families, an amazing movement in America. But like all great spiritual movements, when God is at work in a place, crazy always moves in next door. And so there were some people that were like, oh, so like, being in love with God is like legit or being a Christian is the thing now. So I'm going to show everybody how much I'm into this. And so people would just do really ecstatic stuff. Like they would say, I'm going to climb this tree for God or I'm going to bark like a dog for God. And it was like, uh, okay. And it started to confuse things of, is that what Christians do? Is that what Christianity is? Is it like I do all this crazy stuff? Like what, how do you even know if you're really a Christian? How do you really know that you're connected with God in the way God wants us to be? How do you know? And a pastor named Jonathan Edwards began to press into that. How do you know that you really, you really know him? Is it when you start barking? Is that how you know? Like, how do you know? And as his study of the Bible, what he came up with, which is, I think, really true, and the point I'm trying to make is he said, true religion consists of holy affections, that I love the Lord with my heart, soul, and mind. Because then he said, it's, it's not about just believing the right facts, because the devil does that. And then I remember he said, the devil has been to a better seminary than you, which stood out to me because I was in seminary at the time. And he was like, he's been to a better school. 
He said, you're studying creation. He was there. So it's just believing the right things about God, the right thing. No, because he believes it. Does the devil believe Jesus was the son of God? Of course he believes it. He knows that. Does he believe Jesus died on the cross? Yes. Does he believe Jesus rose from the dead? Yes. He believes all that. So it's not about believing those things. He believes it. The devil. So what makes you different than the devil if you're a Christian? It's not that you believe that. What can the devil not do? He believes those things, but he doesn't see them as lovely. He doesn't see them as precious. And that's the difference. The Christian sees the truth of what Jesus Christ is and what he did, that he's the son of God who became a servant of man to heal us and forgive us, to take away guilt and condemnation and sin and bring us into relationship with God. And we see that as precious. How do you know you're a Christian? Because you love Christ. How do you know you're saved? Because you cherish the Savior. That's how you know. It's about the affections, and they matter. They matter. And so the first thing he prays for is their love, that you would love God and love people. But he says that your love would abound more and more. But then what's interesting is he doesn't say abound more and more in intensity. He doesn't say abound more and more in activity either. He says, I pray that your love would abound more and more with knowledge, with data, with facts, which I think is an interesting thing to say. Because often in America, when we talk about love and we want to talk about the intensity of love, we talk about it as being contra to intelligence, right? That when someone's really in love, you just go, it's just crazy, crazy love, right? (laughs) It's just mad love. And we kind of contrast love with thinking. Like the greatest expressions of love are the ones that are totally like nuts. You know, like uh, he just climbed a water tower and painted her name on it. I don't know. He's crazy, right? Like uh, it means not thinking. And yet here Paul prays for us and he prays that your love would abound more and more, would overflow with knowledge. You go, what does that mean? Well, it makes sense if you think about it. Love always seeks more information about the beloved. It does. That's what love does. You see it with affections, even when it's not full-blown love, just infatuation. I see it on a college campus where I work all the time. You'll see a guy walk into class. He's walking to class. Some cute girl will walk by, and maybe she smiles at him and says, hi. And he goes, hi. And he thinks about her all the rest of the day. And the next day, at that exact time, he's going to walk down that exact path. And he'll continue to do that every day that year in the hopes of just getting a glimpse of her again, right? (laughs) Or if he's more proactive, he'll walk by, she walks by and goes, hi. And he goes, ew, drops everything he's doing. It's like, so, um, I'm lost. Can you help me find where are you going? Yes, that. Can you help me find that? (laughs) So tell me about yourself and what you're looking for in a mate, right? I mean, uh, he's going to get right there. Or you'll see a girl, she'll be interested in a guy, and they don't go, oh my gosh, my affections are stirred by him. Uh, Weird, and then go back to studying. (laughs) It's not what they do. They open a file, and they begin to do CIA-level research (laughs) online, stalking him on Facebook, all right? He's eating peanuts now. They create a dossier, kind of understand him online, start showing up places where he is. They'll be in buildings that doesn't even have anything to do with their major. He'll run into her like, what are you doing in the engineering building? You're an education major. And she's like, what? I heard y'all had a snack bar that was, don't worry about it. So tell me about your dreams, right? And uh, I just want to be near you because I care about you. And love always seeks knowledge of the beloved. And what Paul is saying here is when you come to Christ, Romans 5 says that God has shed abroad his love in our heart through the Holy Spirit that he's given us. That when you come to believe in Jesus Christ, you're marked with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. God God puts his spirit in you and it sheds abroad a love for God in your heart. It's like he starts a little flame of love for God, but it's small. And what Paul prays is that you would take the fuel of knowledge about God, what he's like, how Jesus treated women, how he treated kids, how he spoke to the men he gathered around him, 
that you would drop that knowledge of Christ into your affections. Why? So that they can grow. That your love seeks knowledge. Why? For the stirring and inflaming of the affection. That's how the world works. That's how he wired us. And we're meant to do it with him. That I fuel my affections for God with knowledge of God. That's Paul's prayer, right? It's his prayer. It's interesting. I read a book uh, not long ago about fire. Yes, you heard that right. I read a book about fire. And um, it was talking about forest fires and big ones that go really crazy. And it said to have like a really big raging fire, you need three things. They call it the fire triangle. They said you need heat from the initial flame. You need fuels, trees, grass, anything that'll burn. And you need wind to bring oxygen into the fire and to help it spread. And they said, whenever you get those three things, when you got heat, introduce fuels, have the wind blow over it, they said, you have a fire that's going to grow hotter, grow bigger, grow more intense, and going to spread. And if you keep adding those elements, it creates a feedback loop, and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's unstoppable. And it's a great picture of the Christian life. What's the Christian life? That I take the heat of the love for Jesus that he put in my heart when I came to believe in him. And I introduce to that heat the fuels of knowledge of God through his word that I begin to load into my mind thoughts of God. But can you just gain Bible knowledge and not be more in love with him? Yeah, that's why Paul prays that your love would be filled with knowledge. He's asking God to take that little flame of your heart and as you put the word of God in it, that the wind of God would blow and make your little flickering flame of afflictions affections for him into a bonfire. And that's part of my rhythm every day. As I sit down and my affections for God are too cold, I know it. And yet I ask him, God, as I sit over your word, will you teach me things about you and would you stir my heart, incline my heart to your testimonies? I ask the wind of God to blow over my reading of the word so that this little flame of affection will become a roaring fire that others can be warmed by. That's the Christian life, right? Right? That's why we made the app. It's a shameless promotion, I know, but it's free. <laughs> we did it to help people get in front of the word of God so that they can know God more, so they can love him more. Because what you think about is what you'll care about. And what you care about is what you'll chase. The transforming of the life starts here. So some of you have maybe been hanging out at church all your life. And you go, well, Ben, I don't feel a real burning affection for God. I don't. Well, the goal is not this, like, incredibly emotionally ecstatic experience every second of the day. That's not real life. But it can be a deep, burning love. For some of you, if you go, I don't feel an affection for him, there may be different reasons for that. But can I say to some of you, it may be that you just don't think about him that much. And you might have hung out in these kinds of circles a long time, but you haven't really loaded your mind with thoughts of him, so that flame of affection for him has gotten very low. And you need to just create some space to sit with him. So I remember for me, um, I have a little sister that I've grown up with for most of my life. And when we were kids, uh, I, you know, I don't know, we didn't really hang out that much. Like she was just kind of like, a thing in the house. I don't know. You know, it was like one of those necessities, like, oh, we got one of those. And so we, we didn't necessarily do, do a lot, right? And so I had a little sister. She was in the house. Okay, but I'm living my life. And it wasn't until uh, maybe high school. I remember sitting in the kitchen one day, and she came in there, and I'm there because the food's there, and she happened to be in there, and that's fine. But uh, she starts to talk, and, and then we, we had a, a conversation like where I would say things and she said things back that were like uh, interesting and worthy of comment on. And I just remember it was mind blowing. I remember it being really profound for me. I was like, oh, you're like a person. <laughs> and I remember that just being interesting to me. I was like, how about that, right? And then I moved on or whatever and uh, lived life. But then as it came along, I would talk to her a little bit more, interesting person. I went to college and she came to the same college as me. And man, we began to, to hang out there. And I remember as we hung out, I was like, you're not just like a person, you're like an interesting person. And the more we got to hang out, I'm like, actually, you're like a really cool person. And then we started running together every day. And I was like, you're like 
the coolest person I know. And not just like, because you're my sister. I'm like, no, like if, if I have options of who to hang out with, like I wanna hang out with you. Like you're like the coolest person I know. And I thought, how weird is that? Like we lived together this whole time and uh, I just wasn't really clued into that, right? <laughs> and some of us, that's your spiritual journey. You've been kicking around Jesus' house for years, but you don't hang out with him that much. You don't talk about him that much or think about him or let him in to, to you. There's no honest exchange. And so if you wonder why the affections are low or why the singing part is not that moving for you, it's because you just haven't spent much time getting to know him. And I want to challenge you to get around the, the word of God on your own with a small group of people. Get around people that love him and talk about him. Load your mind with thoughts of God because that's what stirs the affections for God. That's how he's rigged it. And yet it moves on. Some of you may go, well, Ben, what about, uh, I mean, aren't you supposed to do things though? Yes. That we have a heart of affections for God that is fueled by thoughts of God. And then he prays that it would abound in all discernment. That's the ability or capacity to understand a situation and respond to it. That's what discernment is. It's that I take in information and I turn it into good decisions. That's discernment. I know what to do in a given moment. That's discernment. And so he prays that your love would grow in knowledge about God and discernment, the ability to make good choices so that you may approve what is excellent. That word approve means to test something and to see it to be good. And what's interesting, he says that you would approve what is excellent. Like the thing is excellent in itself. What Paul is praying is that you would have the discernment to the, have the ability to recognize that is actually an excellent way to live your life and make decisions. So he prays that you would love God, that love would grow in knowledge, and then it would grow in the ability to understand the world and discern what's the absolute best thing to do and then do it. So you would be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. He says that I pray that you would have a love that is informed and that is wise, that it knows how to live a beautiful life that it would grow in discernment, that I could see what's the best thing to do. If I know God and love God, what's the best thing to do under God? And then I want to do that. There's an excellent way to live. And because I love him, because I know him, I want to do that thing. And as I do that thing, I'm pure and blameless, unadulterated in my decision-making until the day I see him. Right? That's what he's praying for, a discerning, a wise life because of my love, because of my knowledge, right? Uh, there's an easy way to illustrate that, and, and, and it's this. Um, it's funny, when we talk about love, often in our society, we tend to idolize as the pinnacle young love. When we just talk about how sweet young love is, like infatuation. Which is funny to me, because young love is not, is not really that deep. Like if you're dating somebody, or even early in marriage, like, oh, the wedding day, you're like, yeah, but even early in marriage, like, you don't know them that well. I mean, you know them enough to know you wanted to marry them, but you just don't know the person that well. It's when you stack up years that you gain knowledge about them that you can gain discernment as to what they like, right? So I remember for me, when, when Don and I were first married, like one of the first gifts I ever got her was like a board game, which uh, she never opened, ever. Like never took like the, whatever, Sylvain wrapping off of until we gave it away. It was just like, here's a box that never opened because she doesn't play board games. Got it. Okay. <laughs> I was looking in a closet the other day and I saw a watch hanging up, a watch that I bought her that she doesn't wear ever because she never wore watches. I thought everybody did. I was like, everybody needs a watch. False. Your wife doesn't. She doesn't wear watches. Didn't know that when I bought it. Wish I would have. Would have saved some money, right? And yet we're 10 years into marriage and I've gotten to know my wife and my love for her has more knowledge about her and it's made me more discerning in how I treat her. So 10 years in, I know my wife and my love with her is deeper, deeper in knowledge, deeper in discerning what she likes. So that now at 10 years, I remember I was with a young man and we were we were at like a, like a clothing store, the mall, and uh, it was around Christmas, and so we were talking about what we we're gonna get our girls, my wife of 10 years and his girlfriend. And uh, I was buying a shirt for myself or whatever, and he was like, why don't you uh, pick up something for her here? And I was like, I don't wanna do that. And he was like, maybe, maybe I'll uh, buy my girlfriend something here. And I was like, uh. I said, you do whatever you want, but uh, 
buying a woman clothes is kind of like a low percentage shot, man. Like, uh, you can do it. You can hit it. But uh, there's a lot of ways to miss that shot, uh, especially if, if you are just now dating. Do whatever you want. I'm not doing it. Uh, so uh, whatever you want to do. And he was like, well, why don't, you, uh, why don't you just, like, pick her up a gift card while we're here? And I said, a gift card? It's 10 years of marriage, son. Like, you want me to buy her the gift that says, I don't know you? Like, that's, you want me to do that at 10 years? Uh, and I said, no, man, I already know what I'm getting her. And he said, what is it? I'm like, well, my wife loves music. She's leading worship up here. This, this is one of her favorite things to do. I said, when, when you give her free time, she's going to play her guitar. She's going to write songs, right? She loves to write lyrics. When, when she gets around with her friends, they challenge each other to write a certain amount of songs within a given time period. That's, that's where she finds joy. And then she wants to come and share all those songs with me and talk with me about them. When she mentors young girls, they sit around and write songs together. Like that's what she loves to do. It thrills my wife's heart to be a part of that mix. And so what I'm going to do is give her a day away from the kids and I'm going to book time in a studio with a producer where she can go and record one of her songs that she wrote with the girl that she's mentored. And they're gonna lay down the tracks of that song and mix and buttons and knobs and whatever you do to make it come out in a way that sounds good. And we're gonna put it on iTunes so she can have a song that she and her girl wrote together. That's what I'm doing this Christmas. And I remember I told him that and he goes, oh yeah, I think that's way better than a gift card. I was like, you're darn right, son. That's like the best gift I've ever given, man. What is that? That is a love with 10 years of knowledge that's grown in discernment, discerning what my wife likes. And when I've discerned what she likes, I want to do it. Do it because I'm supposed to, because I'm her husband. No, because my love has grown in discernment. And so I discern what she loves, and I do it, and I'm like, this is going to be bananas. She's going to love this. And I do it, why? Because I know when she gets it, it's going to thrill her heart, and my heart's going to be thrilled that she's thrilled, and she's going to be thrilled that I'm thrilled, and everybody wins, and it's a great year in the steward house, right? <laughs> that's why. And that's what Paul's praying for, for you and for me that you would have a love for God that would gain a knowledge of God. And as you know God more, you become more discerning about what he loves. And then you do it not because you're supposed to or else you'll get in trouble. You'll do it because you love him. And you do it because you love him until the day he comes and he's thrilled you're doing it and you're thrilled that he's thrilled and everybody wins. That's the goal. So as I get to know my Savior more and as I love him more, as I get to know him, I start to read the word and you can't deny that he loves the orphan. All through the Bible, he says, I'm close to them. You want to find me? I traffic among the poor. I care about them. And I traffic among those who've lost their dads and their moms. I care about those people. So guess what? If I care about him and he cares about them, what am I going to do with my extra time or income or affections? I'm going there because I know it thrills him and thrilling him thrills me and everybody wins. Right? That's the idea. He loves when his people gather in unity. So what am I going to do? I'm going to promote this. I'm going to be a part of us. We're going to help us. Why? Because as we do this, we know it thrills him and thrilling him thrills me and everybody wins. That's the idea. That's what Paul's praying for. A love that grows in knowledge and discernment so I can be pure and blameless until the day of Christ Jesus. That's the idea. Do you see it? It impacts the heart, it impacts the mind, and that's what fuels the life from the inside out, informed affections, wise affections, active affections. That's what he's praying for. Do you see it? Last question is, how, how do I get it? How do, how do I get that? You go, I don't know that I, I love him like that. I don't know if I'm in a relationship with him like that. He ends the prayer by praying that at the end of the result, we'll be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. How do I live a life that's right before God? I don't do it for him. I do it through him. That ultimately all of this is a gift. It's a gift because it's all his. So my little daughter, uh, who's about to turn three, gave me a sticker the other day. She came up and she's like, here, daddy, give me a sticker. Uh, and she said it. I want to give you a sticker. 
um, which struck me as ironic because I bought the sticker. Uh, it's my sticker, you know, because I bought everything in this house, you know? I'm like, okay, but uh, that's my sticker if we're going to be technical, you know? But she gave it to me in a suite. But when she gave it to me, I wasn't up one sticker. You know, it wasn't like, oh, Ben's assets just ticked up by a sticker. You know, like if you're working on my portfolio, you're like, oh, you got a sticker? Put that down. Like, I already had the sticker, right? But I loved that she gave it to me. It made my day, right? Because I freely gave to her, and out of the fullness of her heart, she wanted to freely give it back. And that was beautiful. And that's Christianity. That God has given us life and breath and bodies and everything else. He's given us all. We're a mess because of sin, you and I. It's a disease we can't cure ourselves of but the grace of God comes and convinces us that we're broken and can't fix us, that we're sick with sin and it leads to death, but that he's already created a cure. That's why Jesus came, to live that perfect life you couldn't, to die and bury in the dirt your guilt, your condemnation, your shame, to bury it so that rising as we believe in him, he says, you are transformed on the inside, given a love for me. On the outside, you're adopted into the kingdom of God, that I am made a part of him, that all of it is a gift to me that I freely receive. And then what do I do with my life? I give it all back. I say, I'm yours. You've given me life and breath and forgiveness and healing and grace and a future. So I give you me. I give you all of me. That's the prayer. That's the Christian life. He stirs my heart with thoughts of him. And so I live for him. That's the Christian life. Do you see it? Now, some of you go, well, Ben, how do I get those affections for him? It's through Jesus Christ, a meditation on him. It's by his grace alone. Uh, Augustine is arguably the second greatest Christian thinker in, in history. The Apostle Paul would be number one, and Augustine, many historians regard as number two, one of the greatest influencers of Christianity ever. Augustine was hopelessly addicted to sex. Mistresses, whole deal, that was his life. Also to his ego, he... Uh, became an orator because that's where the money was centuries ago, and he did it to become popular, famous, and wealthy. And that's he's going for, man. Living the life to fill up Augustine. And uh, he went to go hear a preacher because someone told him the guy was a good speaker. And so he's like, I'm going to go learn some tricks from him so I can use it to amp up Augustine, right? So he goes and listens to the guy, and the guy's talking about the beauties of Jesus. And Augustine realizes, I don't have that that the ability to speak is window dressing. He's talking about something deep in the heart I don't have. And he started to hear about people that loved God and were living to love other people because of their love for God. And it was this deep, beautiful life he didn't have. But he was scared to let go of what he did have. His death grip on a misuse of sex and on a broken life that was selfish and shallow. And so he ran into a garden, started to cry and picked up his Bible and read Romans and began to weep. And then he wrote this in his journal as he was converted. He said, how sweet all at once it was for me to be rid of those fruitless joys I had once feared to lose. You drove them from me, you who are the true sovereign joy. You drove them from me and you took their place. You who are sweeter than all pleasure, O oh Lord, my God, my light, my wealth, and my salvation. And this is the blessed life, to rejoice toward thee, about thee, for thy sake. Christianity is I come addicted and broken, and I reach up empty hands and pray to a God who would rid me of these fruitless joys I'm afraid to lose and take their place you who are sweeter than all pleasure. Renovate my heart so that it loves you. Ignite a flame of passion in you because of the grace of Jesus Christ. And then may I fuel these affections with thoughts of God to live a life that pleases God until the day I get to see God face to face. That's the Christian life. Let me pray for us. Well, Lord, I pray for the person in here that... Um, 
they, they don't know you. Uh, I just pray that they would. Jesus Christ was asked, what's the work of God? What, is, what does God want? And he said, believe in the one that he sent. He said, what God wants is you to believe in me. Believe that I am the son of God who came to heal you and forgive you, not to condemn you, not to crush you, but to set you free. And Lord, I just pray for any in this place that, that haven't come to know you like that, that righteousness comes through Jesus Christ alone. And I just pray, Lord, that they would reach up empty hands and say, Jesus, I want you to forgive me of sin, to cleanse me, to adopt me into the family of God, to renovate my heart. I want to be yours. And that's the starting place of this journey of knowing him. And I just pray if there's anybody with questions about that, they would ask him, the pastors here, or even now cry out and say, oh God, I want to be yours. Lord, I pray for those that maybe have lived in the church world, and maybe they are a Christian for a long time, but the, the flame of their affections for you has grown very low. And Lord, I just pray over them now that even right now as we're praying, you would give them a vision of what it might look like to prioritize stealing away, to load their mind with thoughts of God, to fuel their affections for you, God, to get around your word, to get in a small group of people that would read it together. Lord, help those whose flame of affections for you has gone low to load their mind with the thoughts of God because it's what we think about that we'll care about. And then God, I pray for those that know you and love you and are racing for it. I pray for them what I would pray for all of us, that their love would abound more and more in knowledge and all discernment so that they would approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. That's our prayer, Lord. Let it be. Welcome to Postscript from Faithbridge Church. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the message by sitting down with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. My name is Justin. I'm the worship and communications pastor at Faithbridge. I'm with Ben Stewart, who just finished preaching part two of a three-part series here at Faithbridge on Philippians. Welcome, Ben. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Good to be here. Uh, first thing first, uh, got to answer the Postscript question that came in via text. What yeah. is the red X what is stand the X for? What is the there? meaning behind that? <laughs> right. Uh, a subtle one, I'm sure. I, well, I bought it because it's the letter X. No, I just I liked the shirt. I thought it was kind of cool. We've got um, we've got friends that lead an anti-slavery movement called End It, End it Movement that features the red X, which I love. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of people assume it's one of those shirts, which I'm, I'm fine if they assume that. That'd be awesome. But I, I bought it at the store. So you're not intentionally making a statement today. No, I'm not intentionally making a statement today. But if you want a statement, enditmovement.com is a great statement. It's as good as any. Exactly. It's great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, secondly, seriously, the sermon is, is, is really great. Hit a lot of good points. Um, you were telling me before we started recording that this is actually something that you, you feel like you could fill up a whole sermon series with. Yeah, and did, because, I mean, uh, and I alluded to it a little bit, like, it was profound for me to, and, and I don't feel like my teachers when I was young were misleading me. I think, I think there were some emphases that came back into American evangelism, uh, evangelicalism in, in the late 90s that were really good in sort of putting back forward. The, the late appeal. 1990s. Yeah, 1990s, yeah. The importance of the affections. And, um, but I don't think they misled me. I think I misunderstood a lot of it, but that, that sort of, rediscovery of that of it's all over the bible that you rejoice with joy inexpressible is what first peter says about the lord and you're like that's not a thing you do like okay for the next 10 minutes i'm going to rejoice with joy inexpressible you're like no he's talking about god's changing your heart for him so those ideas were huge for me life-shaping for me and we did at breakaway do a whole series on it uh called the chief end of man that was sort of built out of uh some of the information I alluded to in the talk. So if you want to go deeper into these ideas of the, the, the role of the mind 
in loving God? What does it look like to love him with your mind? The role of the affections. We did a whole series on it, Chief End of Man, which is about that. So this is kind of a meta postscript where we're saying, <laughs> actually, the best postscript you could do is go... So let's, let's talk about that. Yeah. In the sermon, we, talked, we alluded a little bit to the Breakaway app. Tell us a little yeah. bit about that and, and how do we get that and what do we do? Yeah, we were just trying to make what we do more accessible to everybody, you know? And so we created an app that you can download on any device uh, that uh, as soon as you get it on your phone, iPad, whatever, you just click and you have access to all the sermons we've done at Breakaway. You've got access to the audio Bible if you want it, some different information about Breakaway. And then uh, you also have access to a, a new resource we created, little short 10-minute videos or so that, that aren't videos of my face. They're actually, it's me writing on the text of the Bible showing you, here's how I study the Bible. It's teaching you how to study. And uh, that's, that's probably the thing I'm most excited about right now is helping people think along with God through his word. And so uh, that's a resource that's applicable to everybody. And we hope everyone will check out. Cool. So and right now the Philippians is on there now? That's correct. And then will, there more, will you be doing more in the future? Yeah, we're kind of test casing it with Philippians. So uh, I think it's going well. You know, we just launched it. We're going to see what people think. And, and if there's a need and desire, then yeah, we'll keep going. Great, cool. Yeah. All right, so uh, the name of that sermon series again that we should go Chief listen. End of Man. What is the chief end of man? Great. So, yeah. We'll do that. Hey, do that. thanks for being here for Postscript. Thank we'll you. see you next week. And thank you. We'll see you next week as well. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org forward slash postscript.